the flip side of the question sir is personal conviction recently uh, mr nariman he regretted his uh, you know taking the case uh, of bopal how important is personal conviction for a lawyer while accepting a brief you are known to have taken several unpopular cause, causes look once you take up a cause you must do your best for your client but doing the best for your client means doing everything which is legitimate you secure a good result but by means which are totally moral and fair so long as you recognize that you have duties to the client all right but these duties coexist with some duties which you owe as an officer of the court to the court as a member of the public you owe duties to public interest and public justice you also owe duties to your opponent one of the rules of the profession is for example that a lawyer is bound to fulfill promises which may not be legally enforceable because you are a gentleman your word should be as good as a bond your bond should be as good as a bank note so once you recognize these obligations that doing the best for the client does not mean forgetting everything else now for example your client tells you that i have committed this offense that doesn't give you a reason for refusing to defend him people ask that question that why why does a lawyer have to defend a person who tells him that i am guilty the reason that a lawyer can very legitimately advance is that it is society which has made a rule that nobody should be convicted or punished without adequate convincing evidence when you argue a case for a person who has told you in private that he has committed the offense what you are telling the court is not you are you are not swearing on oath that i know that my client is innocent you don't have to do anything of that and that's professional misconduct what you are telling the court is that the evidence on which my client is being convicted does not satisfy the standard which you have laid down for everybody you point out the defects in the evidence and leave it to the judge to decide but we have an express rule but of professional conduct and etiquette uh, incidentally these rules were made by the bar council of india when i was the chairman of the bar we have an express rule which says that no advocate shall refuse to defend an accused who is standing his trial on the ground that the defense will bring him unpopularity or some personal inconvenience or that he believes him to be guilty is an express rule in so many words we have a rule which is especially applicable to those who are in charge of prosecutions which says that uh, um, a lawyer appearing for the prosecution in a criminal case must so conduct the case that it doesn't lead to the conviction of the innocent and that it is his duty to disclose to the other side everything which helps that side to establish his innocence now these are great ethical rules which, which i don't know how many lawyers follow i i regret to say that in my opinion most of them don't but with these rules there is the greatness of the profession that's why you call it a noble and a, and a very high minded profession the very fact that you call it a profession you are putting yourself in a class separate from a trader or a businessman a businessman can advertise he wants to increase his business he can create business a lawyer can't advertise a lawyer can't foment litigation to be able to get a fee and earn money out of it it's the first duty of a lawyer is to prevent people from going to court we have a express rule against a lawyer fomenting litigation just because you are an honorable member of society and 
what is lawful for lesser mortals may not be lawful for you. You know, in 1965, uh, there was a Commonwealth lawyers meeting in, uh, organized by the Australian Bar in Sydney. Uh, the, the function was uh, inaugurated by the Prime Minister of Australia at that time, Sir Robert Menezes who had been a distinguished Attorney General of Australia before he became a Prime Minister. So he told the assembled lawyers from all over the Commonwealth that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am a member of, I am a, I'm a head of the Australian government, but I can tell you that I am able to, to properly discharge my duties as a Prime Minister because I have a sufficiently large number of lawyers who are members of the Parliament both in the ruling party and in the opposition. And then he went on to add that if this number goes down below a certain number which I have in mind, I am afraid I won't be able to remain Prime Minister of this country. And that was a great tribute which was paid by a lawyer, a statesman, to his fellow lawyer. And today you see the kind of joke books that exist about lawyers. Uh, satiring lawyers, uh, attacking lawyers, showing them as uh, creators of troubles. And, and I don't know whether you heard the latest, the, the, the pharmaceutical laboratories in the United States have taken a decision that in their scientific uh, experiments in their laboratories, research laboratories, they will stop using rats, they will, <laughs> they will use lawyers instead. So, they gave reasons, three reasons for, for this decision of theirs. Uh, the first reason was that lawyers are more numerous than rats. <laughs> and the second reason was that uh, it's difficult to fall in love with lawyers, as occasionally we fall in love with our rats. And the third reason was that there are certain things which lawyers do, which even rats will not do. <laughs> so, that's the degradation of the profession to, through which we are going now and it is for the younger generation to bring back the profession to its old glory which it once upon a time enjoyed. The profession had a great uh, responsibility during the emergency. You had a warrant issued against you and uh, a great part of the profession in Bombay stood by you during that time. Do you, would you like to recount those days? Oh, yes, uh, certainly the uh, Bombay Bar did stand by me. But also remember that when I left India on the day the Supreme Court pronounced that notorious judgment, they let us down, let Indian democracy down, they betrayed the Constitution, their obligation. The day I left, we had a meeting at Mr. Palkiwala's place. And I told them, as I said, listen, I'm quite prepared to go to jail tomorrow, you ask me. Um, but there are 101 lawyers undergoing imprisonment in the Nasik jail alone. And I'm quite prepared to become the 102nd lawyer, but I, I don't want to uh, sort of shirk the idea of going to jail, but if I am outside India, be sure that I will be able to carry on propaganda, what has happened in Indian, uh, to Indian democracy and, and how it's a fake emergency, which I was the chairman of the bar at that time. And it was decided that I must, I must leave. And I left that very night and no less a person than the Commissioner of Police escorted me to the plane. I was not a criminal lawyer in when. <laughs> so I went out and I am the only Indian who got political asylum in the United States. I taught law in the United States and then I returned only when the emergency was gone. But while I was teaching, I was most of the time going around the country and 
informing the people how how Indian democracy had been betrayed. And uh, Mrs. Gandhi at that time was shopping for so many things in the United States. She needed money. And uh, uh, the American government, I think uh, at that time it was, I don't know whether it was Carter or somebody. Or, but anyway, the, the American government made it very plain that so long as you have this emergency going in India, you will not get a single dollar. So, so ultimately she had to yield. That was one of the reasons. But the second reason was that she was surrounded by flatterers. You know, they all told her that you are a queen. You have got a, you have got a settled place in the hearts of the people of the country, and uh, you just fight the election and you'll be returned to power. Why are you bothered about? It? And she was wrong. And they were wrong. The advisers. Tell us a bit more about your practice during the emergency. The use of MISA, for example. Sorry. The use of MISA by the government. Oh, well, you see, I'm a ter terrible opponent of this preventive detention, uh, detention without trial. I mean, I grant that in some extreme cases during war or, or some situation which uh, resembles war almost, maybe preventive detention is necessary. It may be necessary, for example, uh, frankly, I'm not sure, with with terrorists today. Because in a way, terrorists are more dangerous than an invading army. When you see an invading army, you kill it, you don't try them. So, possibly, it is justified in very, very grave situations. But not in the phony situation in which Mrs. Gandhi imprisoned all her political opponents, because and see what has happened to that whole family. I don't know. They used that visa, gave it a lot of publicity. And you remember that when the visa came into force, they arrested a few smugglers and paraded them through the streets. And I was the chairman of the bar at that time, and I wrote an article in which I said that I am not pleased I am not amused. Be sure that soon enough this power of preventive detention will be used against political opponents. And that is exactly what Mrs. Gandhi did. And s see the fate which ultimately overtook her. See the fate which overtook her two sons. But nobody realizes this, you see. That. Look at 14th November, yesterday's issue. How much money you spend on photographs of Pandit Nehru? When according to me, he is responsible for most of the problems which India is facing today. Uh, critical faculties of, uh, of even the students are gone. Even the law students and the practicing lawyers are gone. We have all become a nation of flatterers. Now that's a sad part of our, of our profession.